we have the very lovely Joanna Weinberg as our guest. Hello, Jo. Hello, Jeff. Does that mean I'm a matinee idol? Or you, you are, are a matinee, matinee. idol? You, you are far more than that, Jo, but at the very <laughs> least, you are a matinee idol. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't sure if a matinee idol could be a woman. or It's usually a guy, isn't it? I think these days it can, it can probably be just about anything. Right, yes. right. Or I'm a matinee idol spelled I-D-L-E. Well, we are all a little bit, <laughs> a little bit like that, but hence the opportunity to be less idle today and, uh, and have a chat. And um, yes, and here's some more of the, uh, of the Joanna Weinberg story. Um, I'm delighted to chat to you today from our respective um, our pianos, I think. I won't be yeah. playing anything, thankfully. Um, but um, I want to take you back before the time when I met you, and I met you probably early on in your, your time in Australia, a lot of the Australian audiences that know your theatre, your musical theatre, your cabaret, your performances, and, and of course your screen, um, your screen work, um, may not be aware of the background in theatre. And um, I just want to ask you a little bit about that way back. Um, but you were born in South Africa, weren't you, Joe? I was actually born in London. Oh, there we go. <laughs> How did that but come I went about? I went, my, my parents left, they left South Africa um, in the wake of a horrible thing called the Sharpeville Massacre, which was when black people protested against having to walk around with pass books. Um, and they, my parents sort of left in disgust and went to live in London um, and they were musicians. So they, they went and worked, they worked there. My father worked at Stratford-on-Avon as a musician and my mother taught the piano to the children next door and I was born in London. And then we went back to South Africa, oh, in 1970. So I lived there from 1970. And I, I've got no British accent left, although I could probably pull, pull one out if I needed to. Oh, I, I may have spotted you occasionally doing that when necessary. But you were a little girl when you went back to South Africa still. <laughs> um, That's right. The, Theatre, obviously, with musicians and, and musical and performing life around you, either, either way with your parents, you were bound to become a, a performer. Um, what, what are your first memories of, of, uh, of, uh, of strutting the boards um, back in South Africa? Well, we used to always do concerts. My family always did concerts for the rest of the family. We were that family. We were the fun traps, you know. We were the... <laughs> Every, you know, my, my dad played so many instruments, like 16 or 17 early music instruments. He had this huge collection and my mother played violin and the, we had a harpsichord and she had a piano and my brother was an absolute prodigy on the classical guitar. And I, I was more the performer rather than a classical, you know, brilliant instrumentalist. I'm certainly not that. But I think probably just doing family concerts for family events, for birthdays and get-togethers, the, the Weinbergs always put on a show. I'm going to fast forward a little bit because I want to get to what you're most well known for since your arrival in Australia. And you've been here quite a few years now. But um, your, your theatre background, which is, which is really quite... Um, uh, quite uh, high profile in South Africa, was brought home to me when once I, I was in a theatre foyer um, where um, a quite major name in Australia's theatre world um, was introduced to you and was very excited because he instantly knew you from a DVD recording he had of a very famous Othello in which you'd performed at the Market Theatre. Um, yeah. Tell me about that because you... you you really had quite a, uh, a career as a young as a young actress in uh, in Shakespeare and other other um, you know, main stage drama, didn't you? Yeah, I was incredibly lucky to get that role of playing Desdemona opposite John Carney in Othello. I just was in the right place at the right time and got an audition with Janet Sussman, who's a magnificent South African actress, and she was really uh, making her debut as a director at that time and she came she broke the cultural boycott to come to South Africa so there was a lot of chat about that back in London where she lived and people felt she shouldn't go but because the production was um, it was breaking a lot of barriers there had never been a black Othello before an African Othello and of course there was a love affair between a white woman and a black African actor and that was it was against the law um, she wanted to make a point and uh, 
yeah, that's that's what we did. It was John and I became great friends. It was fine. We were fine with it, but the public were not fine. Yeah. A lot of pub were were disgusted, appalled. And and am I to understand correctly? I I heard there were there were death threats. There were demonstrations. There were there all was, of that. It was really highly controversial. Very very violently so. Yeah, people used to demonstrate in the actual show. We had an eight-week run with the most be in the beautiful market theatre, gorgeous set, and the, you know, really beautiful. But every night when we got to the kiss, uh, the audience would get up and, and leave. Not all of them; a lot of them were <laughs> loving it. But there was always staged uh, staged walkouts. Goodness, goodness, me. which was goodness. which was horrible, really horrible, and. I got a, a lot of hate mail, which the lovely staff at the Market Theatre kept from me. I, so I didn't see it. They, I think they just burnt it. So I never had to feel the pain of that. But I did get a really horrible phone call where they rang me and said that my brother had been killed. And um, this was before opening night, on opening night. So I was, in, I was called to the box office and Nandi, who was the box office person, just said, I don't know how to tell you this, but your brother's been killed. And then I called all the hospitals and tried to get the information and finally phoned home. And my brother picked up and said, oh, hi, we're coming soon to the... Th so, you know, that's the sort of thing that the security police would do to intimidate people. Oh, wow, wow, wow. Yeah. I'm going to fast forward because you, um, you did immigrate to Australia with family and... Um, and, uh, and really a big challenge to, to recreate a theatrical life in a new country um, where your name is not a household word um, and you don't have the, 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 uh, the relationships with the agents and with the casting agents and with the theatre companies. How was that as an artist like yourself? Oh, look, I did get an agent when I first came um, and I got the first part that I went up for, which was as a South African part in Wildside for the ABC. And then I never got anything after that at all. So my accent was a real issue. As you can hear, it's still quite strong, my South African accent. And I had babies and I had no family at all here. And it was just too hard. And then I, I really, I went back to cabaret and, and writing. It was just too hard. I've had the odd offer of a wonderful part and of course I've leapt at it I, I still love acting but I don't I don't really consider myself an actress anymore I'm much more of a writer and a cabaret artist and a composer very much because uh, most of your yeah. work in fact all of your work I would say is uh, is musical and uh, yeah. and very and very much so um, tell me about a little bit about before we get on to the very first show and the various different shows the process of, of choosing to do, to write material for yourself in the absence of work being offered to you was that very much a um a discovery a self-discovery um well i didn't have to look very far to find drama it, it's pretty dramatic just looking uh, looking after children in a foreign country where you don't know anybody and the first piece that i wrote was about that you know, I, did, I didn't have to create a historical figure or anything. I just made a character that was based on what was going on in my life, which was that, well, similar to now in lockdown, I just was thinking, I'm stuck. I've got cabin fever. And, I, and I, the first thing I wrote in Australia was, was Sink Songs, which was about a young mum stuck at home with toddler yeah. twins who um, starts to sing songs on the internet. So it was really, it was really my life. And it's still my life. Really, now if you look at COVID nineteen, I'm still doing that. Well, except my children. All, our, all our lives, all our lives, yes. yes but now I've got you're, you're not alone. <laughs> you're not alone. Interesting, interesting though that sing songs is at the very beginning of that of that journey. Um, I think journey is probably a good a good word for a lot of it. Um, and you know, other shows about the 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 uh, the aspect of, of of arriving in a new country and and becoming an immigrant. But um, you know, fast forward to the big movie and, and the feature film Goddess, which very much went back to that lovely material and that story of Goddess. Um, maybe we should come to that chronologically, but it's interesting that, 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 you, um, that uh, that story stayed with you um, uh, right up until the opportunity for a feature film came up. With, and again, quite high profile stars uh, in your work. Yeah, well, it wasn't so much that it's, it, that the experience of having little children stayed with me. It was more that I put the show on actually 
at an RSL at 11 o'clock in the morning. I, I did that show and um, a film producer saw it and the journey began straight away, really. So it was more that it was a, a little story that captured other people's imagination. And I was very lucky to have a team that supported me and Australia Council and there was the Film Council that gave money to that. And Oh, and we did this thing, uh, Mark Lamprell, who helped me write the screen version and who was the director of Goddess, we went around and we did the dog and pony show, we called it, where we go and we play, you know. Um, Welcome to my kitchen sink, this is where I stop and think, where I'm sometimes on the brink of madness. And we'd, do, we'd sing in people's homes and we'd do, I'd sing all the songs from the show and he would tell a story and it took us 10 years to get the money for that film. Now, I think it's on Netflix actually which is it, great it, it, it is uh, it is very much available if people look for it without any difficulty whatsoever i certainly saw it in the on the big screen a few years ago but it's interesting then okay the process of of, of getting uh, to the end point with a feature film can take as long as that because many shows in the meantime take us forward to um maybe the next of uh, of the shows that you wrote still writing for yourself at that point uh, i'm not sure uh, which, which point uh, yes see. probably I'm well I remember seeing you in um, the the lightness of fleeing. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. And I've always done shows for myself because it's just easier to rehearse them when you're a mum. You know, you can rehearse at home in your bedroom. So yeah, I didn't start writing stuff for pe for other people until a little bit later. In fact, I wrote um, for Short and Sweet, Short, Sweet and Song. I wrote every single Saturday a 10 minute version, which also became a musical and you were in it. Ah, I know, I know. Well, that was a serendipity for me. But I remember the beginning of that because it was a 10 minute show. It was a, it was it was a snippet of a musical. It was a fabulous piece. Uh, but of course, it, you know, it was, uh, it was all my loves. I immediately uh, identified with it because it wasn't just musical yeah. theater, but it was about soccer and about yeah. soccer parents and crazy about soccer, soccer parents. parents. Absolutely, yeah. and, and, and all their interests. And it was, I, I, don't, I could see immediately this had to be a full, a full-length show and sure enough you know, a year or so later or maybe two I get a phone call from Joanna Weinberg you know, saying oh I've, I've actually made a full-length show of that thing that you quite like to come up oh my god so I had to have a piece of that yeah yeah and you were perfect ah, you well, but enough about me <laughs> but enough about me the mad yeah you know, the mad uh, soccer parent on the sideline it's a, it's a real stretch um, <laughs> let's go to some of the other ones um, that you wrote but other people then, since we're talking about that, shows that, you know, that were big productions. Um, take us through another of the, of the shows where you didn't appear, um, but you wrote for the stage. Yeah, well, I, w I wasn't in every single Saturday. Um, in fact, I directed that, but neither, I think. Um, yes. and on tour. Oh, gosh, what did I do next? I did a heap of, of solo shows, and then I think the next one was actually The Secret Singer, which was for other people. That starred Kate Mannix and Genevieve Lemon. That was- I'm remembering they, Life Force. I'm thinking oh, no, of Life Force, because Life Force won, uh, won awards, and it was part of the Sydney Fringe, and that, yeah. uh, that won the Best Show Award. It did, and that's, it's only ever had 10 performances. Um, and really, that's my own fault. I should really get my act together and put my weight behind it and get it back up again. Because that was quite, that was quite, um, actually, that was very successful. People loved that show. There were lots of tears. It was about IVF. And that was because my bestie, my best friend, who happens to be a wonderful singer, had been trying for six years to have a baby through IVF. And so I had been, my stuff always comes back to the personal, always. Mm. And I had listened to her tales of struggle and frustration and love and sadness and hope and loss. And I, I kind of wrote it for her. I wrote it so that she could play out on stage what she'd been through as a woman trying to have, mm -hmm. the, have a child. And, and, and she did. She played it. And she has, she has twins. She had twins, so it's a, it's a it's a happy story in every possible way, and that had a wonderful story. cast, um, a wonderful cast, yeah. not just the singing you know star actually as herself, but um, yeah. a fabulous cast. I mean, you've always been able to interesting, been able to attract um, you know some top performers to your shows. Yeah, it's because I I cook for them. <laughs> 
<laughs> I say there'll be pie every day at rehearsal. <laughs> Hungry actors, that is always going to work. Um, but also, but also part of the part of the secret, I think, um, in your success in getting so many shows up has been also the um, you know, the producer in you, the ability to kind of find find people, find funding, which is hard to come by, but also just to to you know to pitch the shows, to to get them seen, to and to rework them. Um, you're you're probably one of the hardest working uh, writers that I know. I, I don't know how many how many uh, drafts of uh, of shows you go through. Certainly I with the ones that I've that. been associated with, the reworking, the workshopping, the new versions of it, trying these ones, adding new songs, taking songs out, being quite harsh critic of yourself. That's a tried and tested road though. I mean, if you read any literature about musical theater and how it's created, especially in America, which is so supportive of music theater and has been a trailblazer, New York, Manhattan, you know, Broadway, that's the way they do it. So I've just read books on it and that's what they do. Nobody puts something on untested. It's crazy. People will pour all their money into some gorgeous project or it's gorgeous to them and it will flop and the critics will eat them alive. And it's, I'm not prepared to do that. I've been in the theatre for too long and I've got to put work in front of an audience. Only an audience can tell me where I need to change. Indeed. Well, let's go back to some of your solo shows because. Uh, people who are watching this will have seen you in many, many different um, venues, like a, like a Camelot, um, and, and if not at Darlinghurst Theatre, where you were performing in someone else's show. Once last year was a fabulously successful show, probably going to come back when we're at the other side of all of this. Um, but let's go back to some of your solo shows. Yeah, I'm sure it will. Um, but some of your other wonderful, wonderful solo shows where you created a show either for yourself or yourself with a band. Um, what would you say is your favourite show? Because there, I can think of four or five titles just off the top of my head that I've seen in the last few years. Can you? What, what moves you most or what did you enjoy most? I think I liked Baroness Bianca's Blood Songs the best. <laughs> it was a very hard show to sell because people thought it was a vampire show, which is probably my own fault because the title wasn't clear enough. People thought, oh, it's a vampire show. Some people came dressed up in the audience like vampires. Anyway, that, so that was perhaps my mistake. But in fact, it was about addiction and it was such an interesting story. And I'm very proud to say that every time I performed it, somebody fainted. <laughs> Higher praise cannot be found, I'm sure, I'm sure. Well, the thing is, it was about a nurse, it, it, was, it was based on the Countess Elizabeth Bathory, um, who was, this dreadful psychopath woman who killed all the young women who came and worked for her. Um, and I played a modern nurse who had an addiction with blood, but who had a strange sort of sixth sense. She could smell it. She could smell people's blood type and she was addicted to that, to the fragrance of it. So it was very dark and very funny. Um, and I loved doing it. It was extremely challenging because it was about 90 minutes long of, is this very strong accent, you know, talking like this the whole time. And I played the piano accordion in that as well. And um, it was challenging that one, but I, I really enjoyed it. I just enjoyed the, watching the audience's faces. Sometimes they were just a yes. scar. Jaw dropping. Jaw dropping. And I, well, it was a very naughty show. It was a very naughty show. Was it? Well, it was because I referenced a lot of blood. There was no blood in the show, but I talked about it so much that people who had an issue with blood would feel sick or they would faint. But I think, yeah, people really enjoyed it and it got picked up. That was done last year in Canada. So I was very proud of that. And the but woman who did season, it. That original season was The Haze, wasn't it, in Darlinghurst? So that was a main stage, yeah. Yeah, a main stage yeah. season. Um, yeah. Was, okay, so really interesting. So that one's had fewer performances. I'm sure you'd like to do it again though. So um, producers? Actually, I did it for the Crown Prosecutors Conference. That was one of the most interesting, but, and they watched it in total silence. <laughs> and I was thinking, I'm just dying here. They hate me, they hate this. They're just not getting it. And at the end, there was this awful silence. And I was like, oh. And then they applauded like mad and they all came up to speak to me and they had, had a completely different response to the piece because they 
dealt with real crime every single day. They dealt with real blood. They dealt with blood type. And they'd been fascinated by the criminal aspect of the show. So, but I remember it was very scary because they didn't laugh. They didn't respond at all. But they loved it. Yeah. Now, I did it. Charity. I did it. So go on. Sorry. I did it all over the place. I did it in Melbourne and I did it at this great little bookshop. What's it called? Smith's Alternative Bookshop in Canberra. So I did, did travel a bit that one and then it went to Canada, but I didn't do it there. Now you've had a, a charity aspect to some of your shows. I remember one of them, um, Am I Right? Was it 12, 12 Shoes? Mm -hmm. um, oh, 12 uh, Shoes for September. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yes, that, yes, yes. So that was interesting because I've, well, I've got a recording well, of the album of that. That was back in the day when we when artists sold CDs. Yeah, the, the proceeds, such as they were, went to Smith Tabba. Smith Tembo is a gorgeous little girl who lives in Johannesburg just for her school uniform and her shoes and her books and that kind of thing. Yeah, she was a bit overwhelmed by the, by the whole thing. She's, no. she's, she's in high school now and she's doing great. Oh, that's, that, is, that is wonderful. And, you know, she has a show named for her, basically. Yeah, she yeah. does. Now, The Piano Diaries is very autobiographical too. You've brought in all sorts of things and all sorts of different fantasy aspects, but there's some very, very um, powerful um, historical, autobiographical um, parts to that show. I remember being quite yeah. you know, shocked or, or you know, set back by a couple of them. Tell us a little bit about The Piano Diaries. Oh yeah, that's, that's my most personal show. It's about my grandmother's piano, which I still have, it's upstairs. Um, my grandmother played my mother went to music school and was a brilliant pianist, but because her health was terrible, she couldn't really pursue it, but she was so good. She's still good. She's brilliant. Um, and then it came down to me when my grandmother passed away. So it's, it's come down through three generations and um, perhaps I'll leave it. I'll, well, I will. I'll leave it to my children one day. So it's really is a family piano. So the piano diaries, is a tale told from the piano's perspective from when the piano, when the ivory, it's got ivory keys and it's when the keys were taken from the elephant in Africa. So it's about the ivory keys from the elephant in Africa. The piano was made from uh, African rosewood. It was put together in England, which is where my grandfather bought it. And then the piano now, of course, has come all the way across all these oceans and lands all the way to Australia. So it's a piece about relocation, it's a piece about identity, it's a piece about belonging, and it's a piece about immigration. Mm -hmm. And I'm sort of, I sort of play my way through that. I've got the songs for my parents, songs for the piano itself, um, songs for South Africa and songs for Australia. <laughs> yes, yes, oh, the, you know, the piano in the cabaret, I remember, um, just, you know, it's a honky-tonky kind of piano song. Um, they all have a different voice, as you say, from you know, the different yeah. places in which pianos. Yeah. Play. It's beautiful, it's beautiful. Now let's go, let's go on to some of the more recent ones. Um, probably the one that you're still involved with now, because I know it's very, very popular, is, uh, is Pandora's Bag. Um, tell us about that, because again, there's a theme to it, and it, it brings in inspiration for you for, all, you know, for new songs, but, um, Quite, quite quirky. Yes, yes. Well, that's why I'm dressed up today because I've just been recording it. So um, Pandora's bag is about my handbag collection ostensibly, but really it's, just, it's about women because the, the bag is a metaphor for the female body, which is a carrier or a, a container, if you like. And I've just taken the lives of different women and I've made stories about their handbags. I, I was given some, here, here's one that I was, I was actually doing the show, yeah, as I say, on Zoom a moment ago. So this one was from a friend of mine that I met in an aged care facility. I was singing to her. Her name was Vita. Um, and I wrote a song for her. So, and this is my favourite one, this one over here. This one. <laughs> of course. My piano accordion bag. Um, yeah, so that one's been, it's been going for a while. And I've got, oh, sorry. <laughs> I've got so many songs now but yeah it's about women it's about it's the feminist show about women and this very intimate thing a handbag this thing that you carry around that has your intimate personal belongings 
and you've Image. invited members of the audience to bring along their own handbags and tell a story. That's something that I yeah. found, you know, delightfully um, uh, sort of quirky and, and, and very entertaining about the shows when I've seen it. Oh my goodness, the things that people told me you would not believe. I had one woman say, um, I, I'm pa I, I, I have got, no, I'm Pandora, I'm Pandora, I'm Pandora. And I didn't know what she was talking about. It turned out her name was Pandora. <laughs> She was trying to explain. I don't know. I didn't understand that one very well. Um, I had all kinds of things, which, of course, right now you're asking me. I can't think of a single one. Um, well, there's, there's, the, the, there's, the doc, there's the flying doctor, of course. Oh, yeah. No, I was trying to think of the audience. Oh, the oh audience, audience members with their, audience with their stories. Their with their over the years. Oh, there was a woman whose toddler always used to put a rock in her handbag so that she wouldn't be lonely. And she couldn't understand why her bag was so heavy. <laughs> <laughs> There was a one woman whose bag was stolen by a monkey. It ran up a tree. There was another woman whose mother thought she liked owls and always gave her owl handbags, these dreadful kitsch owl handbags. There was a story of a woman whose best friend left to live in England and they bought matching handbags. And every time they look at their bags, they think of each other. Um, so that my, my favourite part was when the audience had their stories about handbags. Well, I'm yeah. going to ask you. I'm going to ask you since this is um, you're on your mind at the moment, and you've just done a little performance of it, um, yeah. even if it, it was. I'm going to ask you in a second if you might be able to come up with a little something from there. But just before sure. that, just before we finish up, maybe you can tell us where uh, where we will next hear or see from you given that we are in mysterious and challenging times, but what's the most yeah. likely thing that's uh, on the on the table or at the piano for you that's coming uh, up? To yeah. Oh, well, Pandora's Bag is going to be on very soon on this thing called the Soul Sessions. So I'll tell you all about that. So that'll be exciting. Um, I've divided it into little sections like episodes. So I'm doing that. And uh, I'm writing a big, big show at the moment about this a wonderful woman called Gracia Nasi that I, I found her in a Spanish Jewish museum. It's a Sephardic story, extraordinary woman. She was a conversa. She was pursued by the Spanish Inquisition. She went from Spain to Portugal, to Antwerp, to Ferrara, to all across Europe, to Venice, where she had a huge fight with her sister and then escaped and eventually uh, lived in Istanbul. Um, Constantinople under the protectorate of Suleiman the Magnificent and I've been researching and writing that for three years and I have almost finished it. So the next stage of that is going to be a public workshop so I'm really hoping I'm applying for grants as we speak and I'm just hoping that I can get some funding just to do the workshop. It's a big cast um, and I'm, I've even got someone in mind for the lead, this beautiful a really nice part uh, and it's the first Jewish musical I've ever written the first Jewish play but so, no very much a musical so that's going to be the next thing I'm going to do well there'll be lots of actors looking around the place or looking at that to, to see if they can be involved in those workshop yeah. performances yeah I think the Jewish community will be so interested to hear about this you know extraordinary woman who really set the bar very high. She, oh, I mean, left out the most important thing. I mean, she, she saved so many refugees. She was basically a female Schindler in a way in that she saved a lot of Muslim and Jewish and Protestant and any kind of heretics, people who didn't fit the Catholic uh, proscription of how they were meant to be she hit them in the bottom of her ships and got them out of spain and portugal where they lived free happy lives so it's a story about refugees as well so i'm excited about that so that's the next thing i'm doing yeah we we will look forward to um seeing and hearing some some much more of that that'll be fantastic um yeah to, to give us any previews of that that's probably on the drawing board and that needs to be kept under wraps but yeah, could yeah. you maybe finish up for us today by giving us a bit of a treat, something from Pandora, your choice? Yeah, sure, sure. Well, I think just because there's so many doctors out there helping us and doing the testing and so on, I might just do this song about Dr. D, who's a friend of mine who really is on the, 
the front line of testing. She has to put on her scrubs every day and um, wear the mask and the gloves. And I, I just, I really am grateful as we all are to all the, the medical profession, the people, the nurses, the doctors, all the people out there helping us. So I'll do a little bit of the song. Amen, but amen to that. And, um, yeah. and uh, you can take us out, jo Joanna Weinberg with us today on the matinee, um, not the piano mm. story, not the couch. Thank you so much for talking to us today. And uh, yeah, take it away with Dr. D. Pleasure. Was she the very pinnacle of modernity? A flying feminist and a top GP. Who is she? The flying doctor from Sydney. You just call Dr. D. When you're scared of hepatitis B. And you're 20 miles from Calgary. Make a call to Dr. D. Bye-bye. See you Bye. again Thank soon. Thank you so much. See you Bye. soon in real life, I hope.